All right, welcome to Amber Books, 40 Minutes of Confidence, number 14, the final four of building systems. This is one of my favorites, and we'll get into why later. Around uh, 200, humans have not been around that long. We've been around about 200,000 years. And actually, we were in East Africa only until about 50,000 years ago. Um, and then we started moving around to the rest of the world. Uh, when, we are, when our numbers got down to something like 3,000 individuals, we almost went extinct until we started exploring beyond. And we set up in clans of about 150, and these clans would float around from spot to spot, and sometimes they'd settle, sometimes they'd move around, but they'd always go berry picking and hunting. And we'd come into like these forks in the road all the time where you could, you know, you could go this way or you could go this way. And so that's how we evolved because we've only been uh, practicing agriculture for about 10,000 years. So we've been around 2,000 years and practicing agriculture for only about 5% of that. And almost all of our evolution was about this choice. And we would say, huh, you know, it seems like two of the last three people who went this way didn't come back, <laughs> including my aunt. So I think I'm going to go this way. And so that's how we were kind of set up. Now, this is typically how we see the world now. And I think we maybe in error think that our brains work like computers, but even computers work on ones and zeros, kind of on off, right, left kind of decision making. And so in reality, the final four is really a good way to make any difficult decision. If you're trying to decide uh, what firm to take a job with and, and you have three or four choices, instead of choosing, uh, instead of looking at a list of three or four choices and making pros and cons, you're actually better off from an evolutionary point of view doing a final four and just picking you know, two of them to go off against the other two. If your child is trying to decide what college to attend, uh, you can encourage her to make a final four list. It's better than a list of seven and then just go ahead and decide. So that's what we're going to do today, the final four. And the final four has another benefit, which is there's really just not that many hours that an architect can spend on this stuff, uh, whether it be sustainability or anything else. And it gets to be greenwashed pretty quickly when you can say, oh yes, we have um, uh, we have accounted for solar geometry because of this, and we have a uh, we have an eco tile like I talked about in a previous meeting because of that. So I made this for you guys um, so that you can help identify what is a priority for this particular building. And if you're not sure, you can just pick the higher seed. So the higher seed is generally more important in most cases, but not all cases. So. I got feedback from a few of you, and of course I've gotten feedback over the years because uh, I've helped more than 10,000 folks pass this exam, so, or at least take study for this exam, not sure how many have passed, but most have. Um, and, and so I want to I wanna, uh, I wanna go through these and kind of start to go through them and, and, and maybe start to discuss uh, what each of these is good for or what type of building each of these uh, should be considered a, a, a candidate in. So I'll go ahead and start on the left top. Energy use is a number one seed. So that means that um, uh, in the absence of any additional information, you want to go ahead and let energy use move on to the next round. Uh, by groundwater loop, I'm talking about running, well, there's two different ways to do that. We can run a a loop of water in the ground, which in the summer right now is cooler than the inside air, and then we can blow um, we can blow air over that pipe of water. Um, but typically, that's not done so much anymore. That's more of like a '70s thing. Typically, if we're going to go through the expense of a groundwater loop, we're going to tie it to a heat pump and make a geothermal system. And those um, those groundwater loops, if you have a lot of land, they're typically going to be uh, uh, horizontal trenches uh, because it's much cheaper to just dig down three feet in the trench system, you know, something um, on your land like this in plan. Um, and uh, uh, if you don't have much land, then we're going to dig down in a, in, a, in, a, in a well. We're going to go down vertically. So that's the difference between trenches and wells. Um, light colored roof, we've actually covered quite a bit in our recent uh, meetings. 
And if you have a light colored roof, that's very important if you have a big roof, if you have a roof that faces east or west, uh, if you're in a sunny climate or a hot climate, or if you have a big building, because big buildings need cooling just about year round. And you know what? Um, selecting a light colored roof, it gives you a lot of bang for your architecture hours buck. So um, just spending a little time making sure you have a cool roof um, that will, that will, for your building, that will get you a lot of energy savings relative to the amount of time it takes to carefully choose a color of a, of a membrane roof for a larger building. Argon on the window cavity, we covered that last time as well. Um, if you have argon in the, in the double pane glass in an um, IGU, an insulated glazing unit, if there's argon in there instead of air, you get two benefits. Argon is less conductive, actually convective, but it, at the scale of a window, we talk about it as conduction um, because it's kind of through a solid, even though it's through a gas in the middle of the, the solid. Um, and so it's less conductive, so it gives you a higher R value by a little bit. And it also, as long as the argon doesn't leak, it should prevent uh, condensation from occurring in between the two panes of glass. Smart thermostats are really important um, if you have uh, places where people aren't going to, well, well, people where there's occupied and some of the day and unoccupied some of the day, um, which is just about every building. Um, uh, if it's predictable, it can be working, it can be working on a schedule. If it's unpredictable occupancy, it can be working, um, uh, it can be working based on an occupancy sensor or some other way. And generally, we want to we want to use smart thermostats just about anywhere, um, and especially as we're getting to the Internet of Things and things are becoming smarter in general, uh, it's, it's it makes more sense to have smart thermostats because uh, one of the complaints of smart thermostats before was that the mechanical systems really they they, they either made them too complicated or the mechanical systems were too simple um, to really understand the smart thermostats. So if you have, for instance, uh, uh, an intermittently occupied um, room, like a conference room that's only occupied sometimes um, uh, during certain times of the year. If you run the Cannes Film Festival and you have all these theaters that are open and empty for much of the year, you don't want to run them year-round. You want to have smart thermostats. Thermal bridging is something we also covered last time. Um, and it's the idea that if we have a piece of structure Typically, uh, it's a big problem if it's concrete or steel, and that structure spans both the inside and the outside, and it gets cold, then the cold from outside is going to conduct its way to the inside. Why isn't it as much of a problem in the summer? Why is that more of a wintertime issue? Go ahead and answer aloud to yourself. I'll give you 10 seconds to tell me why is thermal bridging a bigger difference, a bigger deal in the winter? Thermal bridging, well, just generally thermal comfort, thermal performance, um, when it comes to conduction, and that's what we're talking about, where the outside of the balcony gets cold and that conducts into the inside, it's based on the delta T, uh, and the delta T is the difference in temperature between inside and outside. In the winter, the difference between inside and outside may be 70 degrees. In the summer, the difference between inside and outside may be 20 degrees. So because it's, much, because it's much colder than the inside air in the winter, that's why we're very concerned with thermal bridging. And the way we deal with thermal bridging is we have a thermal break. We have some way to uh, interrupt the continuous concrete or the continuous steel that would otherwise be going from a roof overhang into your building, from a parapet into your building, from a balcony into your building, from a cantilever into your building, uh, from a walkway into your building, and so forth. All right, minimize east and west glass. I'm pretty sure just about all of you guys know why we do that. We do that because of solar geometry. The sun is generally uh, in the east and the west, especially in the warmest parts of the year. In the winter time, it's in the southeast, southwest, and south. But generally, we want to minimize east and west glass because it brings in the most sun at the time of year where we need it the least. Energy Star appliances. Energy Star, of course, is the program that the uh, government has created 
and uh, to, to identify which appliances use less energy than baseline. And Energy Star appliances become really important if you have like multifamily housing. Um, if you have more efficient refrigerators times 200 units, that can be some real energy savings. If you just kind of pick the refrigerators based on whatever, uh, you could be undoing a lot of your other work. So if, for instance, you were doing multifamily housing, um, then Energy Star appliances would probably um, upset the number four seed, minimize east and west glass. If you're doing a single residence that's a pretty small building and that um, maybe is in a warm climate, then east and west glass, of course, would win. Window shading. Um, almost all buildings have their peak uh, energy use in the summer is based on, is totally controlled by sunlight coming in the windows. So any way that you can shade windows, actually, a number six seed is probably pretty, pretty bad for that. In fact, window shading could probably be justified as number two or three seed, um, but these things happen in final four. So window shading is important in any building, but especially a building with a lot of glass, uh, a building in a warm climate, or a big building that pretty much needs cooling year round, uh, window shading becomes important. Ceiling fans, because they involve air movement, air movement is most important in a warm and humid climate. So ceiling fans are most useful in a warm and humid climate because we can promote evaporation from our skin even though the air is already saturated. So the air doesn't want to take evaporation from our skin, but our skin wants to evaporate. So if you are in uh, East Texas, if you are in South Louisiana, if you are in uh, uh, the panhandle of Florida and so forth. If you're somewhere where it's humid in the summer, ceiling fans are a good idea unless they're unlikely to be turned off. So ceiling fans save energy if they're not on when no one's in the room. But if you have uh, an office and no one really has authority, kind of no one feels the authority to be able to turn off the ceiling fans for the rest of the office, even if no one's in the conference room, um, then the ceiling fans don't save energy at all. But if you can set the thermostat higher for the air conditioning or have the air conditioning on less of the year because you have ceiling fans available, um, then ceiling fans are a great energy saver and one we don't talk about very much. Energy savings in dollars is pretty self-explanatory. That would be very important if you had uh, an intensive energy user or you lived in an area like California or Hawaii where energy prices are quite high. Um, district cooling plant. Um, that's where a central chiller makes cooling, uh, makes chilled water for the campus. Typically, those are used and important in big campuses like big corporate campuses, uh, 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 university campuses, hospital campuses, uh, maybe to a lesser extent government campuses. If you have the same client over a vast area, but a contiguous vast area where you can run underground pipes with chilled water, you can be both more efficient and uh, less cost and maintenance cost and quieter and you get all kinds of benefits by making the chilled water somewhere a block or two away and pumping it underground in a circuit and then our air handling units can, can tap in to that already chilled water. So for big campuses, that's where we have district cooling plants. Double glazing just means double windows or IGUs, insulated glazing units. Typically, single glazed units are something like R1. Uh, double glazed units are something like R2. Uh, and then, of course, if you fill it with argon, maybe it's R2.5 or even R3. Geothermal heat pumps. Um, those are heat pumps that use the underground. They use these ground water loops uh, underground to, um, to temper the... Uh, to temper the um, the temperature swings that might otherwise uh, have a real impact on the efficiency of a, a system that was trying to cool when it's hot outside or trying to heat when it's cold outside. So the benefit is that if you can take water and cool it off by sending it underground in the summer and heat it up by sending it underground in the winter, then you can cover your uh, heat exchanger, your, in the summer it would be your condenser, you can cover that with cool water so it doesn't the, the pump doesn't have to work as hard because it's using the cool of the water. In the winter, it's using the heat of the water because underground, 
it's pretty much the same temperature year round. So for most of the middle of this country, underground, you dig three feet down or so, it's about 50 or 55 degrees, depending on where you live. Um, and so we can utilize the fact that it's not that hot down there in the summer and it's not that cold down there in the winter to actually make our air conditioning and heating systems significantly more efficient. In cooling, it's probably about twice as efficient. Um, fresh air, um, that's a number two seed, which is a nice high seed, but you know, you know how this stuff works, right? If, if there's gonna be a basketball tournament, sometimes a team is really hot going into the tournament, and I would say fresh air right now in the, in the, in the, uh, as we record this in a pandemic, uh, fresh air has become definitely uh, the favorite, even though it's a number two seed. Uh, so if you're, um, if, you are maintain, if you're operating a building, this may not affect architects as much because the pandemic will, uh, will fade before some of you guys hear this on YouTube, but if you're uh, operating a building, fresh air becomes very, uh, very important in, 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 a, uh, in a kind of virus spread condition, for instance. Um, and typically what we want is we want to have lots of fresh air, but not too much. Because uh, too much fresh air means we're bringing in too much outside air. Too much outside air means that air is hot in the summer and cold in the winter. And that means we have to expend energy to heat it up in the winter or cool it off in the summer. So generally, we want to right size our fresh air. We would prefer to have just the right amount. If you don't get extra credit for having extra fresh air, historically. Um, now again, uh, we are in a really funny moment right now, but historically, fresh air is a good solid number two seed. Low off-gassing materials. So materials that off-gas are going to become important if you have an allergy clinic, if you have a hospital, uh, if you have an allergic client. Um, if you um, uh, if you generally don't like crappy particle board <laughs> or engineered wood, so low off gas low off gassing materials are typically materials that that have, if you use materials that don't have glues or that have low VOC glues, you're using low off gassing materials. All right, that is our uh, our east bracket, our south bracket now. Uh, is uh, carbon footprint, um, which of course is related to energy use, uh, but not in an exact way. Uh, where I record this, 89% uh, of the electricity that's running my iPad now comes from coal. And some of you guys are in California and you guys have less than 1% coming from coal. So if we're using the same iPad, you're actually, your carbon footprint is way lower than mine. Um, so carbon footprint is not just about your building, it's about what the utility uh, who's serving your building is going to be providing your building. 100% outside air. This becomes a big issue in a lab building um, or during a pandemic. So if we have a, a lab building where there's a chemical or a biological contaminant that we're working with, we want to make sure that we're not recirculating the same air. Once you introduce that idea, that idea that we're no longer recirculating the same air, then all, a whole can of issues comes up. Because now we're bringing in 100% fresh air because if there's a spill in lab four, we don't want it to contaminate the rest of the building by the air being sucked in and recirculated after it's recooled to the rest of the building. So instead we're gonna exhaust all the air from each lab space and then bring in new air. And that's why lab buildings on a per square foot basis use just about as much energy as any type of building. And then we start to talk about things like chilled beams and really smart fume hoods and uh, uh, radiators in the winter and all kinds of ways to prevent uh, or minimize the need for recirculated air, ways to heat and cool our building without, without recirculating air. So typically, again, carbon footprint would advance, but if we we're a lab building, the 100% outdoor air would upset, we'd have a number 16 seed upset a number one seed. Um, uh, and, and around here, we call that UVA. All right, uh, thermal mass. Um, thermal mass is one of the ones that, that someone asked at, at the beginning of this call uh, on the chat uh, for me to cover. So thermal mass and thermal resistance are different things, are different things. So uh, what I want you to do is think about sticking a oven, uh, sticking a, a, 
uh, a brick and a piece of insulation in an oven all day and then setting the oven at 400 degrees and then coming home and opening the oven, putting the brick in the thermal, the, the hot brick and the hot insulation on the top of the stove and just wait five minutes and then touch the two and you'll find that the thermal insulation is no longer hot but the thermal mass, the brick, is. So what thermal mass is, is it's this idea that uh, mass is the idea that something stays hot or cold. And um, thermal resistance or insulation is the idea that we're making a wall to, to hot and heat and cold. We're preventing, we're, um, help me think of a word, we're, we're closing the door to hot and cold. These are all architectural metaphors and I don't like using that because you're going to think I'm talking about closing a door literally. So we're, 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 we're the bouncer telling the cold or heat not to come in in the case of insulation. And in the case of thermal mass, we're actually the bouncer telling everyone to stay inside, if that makes sense. Um, so, so insulation will say prevents conductive heat transfer through the, the building envelope. Now mass, of course, are things like brick and concrete, sand to a lesser extent, concrete block, Water is, has a high thermal mass um, and it's typically used, uh, it's almost never used in practice. <laughs> uh, if it is, not properly typically. Um, it's certainly asked a lot about on the exam. Um, so uh, mass is useful, thermal mass is useful for a small building in a climate where it's very hot in the day and very cold at night. What climates are very hot in the day and very cold at night? Well, we're talking about desert climates. We're talking about Albuquerque. We're talking about Phoenix. We're talking about maybe Salt Lake City. So if it's very hot in the day and very cold at night, what we can do is we can use thermal mass inside of our building, inside of our insulation. And when it heats, when the outside heats up, it will store that heat for later and keep the building from overheating because some of that heat will go into heating the mass instead of heating the air around the occupants. And at night, um, uh, the building will still be warm as outside cools off the thermal mass. Now, in reality, once we put an air conditioning system in and we insulate the building, which is what we would do when we put an air conditioning system in, thermal mass is a little bit different a role. It's still good for preventing the building from overheating, but it's not as good at kind of offsetting and providing what's called a thermal lag, where it's hot inside after it's hot outside and it's hot cool inside after it's cool outside. A lot of that benefit goes away in a building built in the 21st century because most of the buildings you guys are working on, especially in desert climates, have mechanical air conditioning available and they're going to be run almost all the time. So thermal mass is not as important as it used to be, um, but, um, but it, it's still uh, worthwhile knowing for this test. Um, so it's as an eight seed, that's kind of a ripoff. Thermal mass, probably I should have put it as like a 11 or 12 seed to tell you the truth. Occupancy sensor tied to lights. Um, so thermal mass is like a, is like a team that has like two injured starters. Um, they got in based on the record, but they're really not that threatening. The occupancy sensor that's tied to lights, um, and, and I promise I'll stop the, the obvious final four metaphors now. I think enough is enough. But the occupancy sensor tied to lights, that's especially important any place you have uh, people who are expensive doing uh, clerical work. So if you have lawyers or engineers or architects, um, you want to make sure that the, uh, that the lights dim when the daylight is out and vice versa because people perform really well in daylight and you want to give them a lot of daylight, especially if they're high paid. But you should get, frankly, from an ethical point of view, everyone should get daylight. Um, but but um, but uh, from a dollars and cents point of view, uh, bringing daylight properly into a space is by far, by far the best return on investment of everything in here. If you are not doing a warehouse, if you actually have human beings that you're paying, those human beings that you're paying are typically going to be something on the order of 90% of your monthly expenditures as a company um, or as a client. Uh, or even human beings you're not paying, like if you have a school, you're not paying human beings, but you want the students to perform well. So if people are there at a high density and you want them to perform well, you want to provide them daylight. If you're providing them daylight, you want the lights to dim when there's no one in there. 
um, if there's no one in there. Uh, so uh, that way you can save the energy from the lights. Wall insulation, that's obvious. Uh, what that's for, that's for conductive, um, uh, to limit conductive heat losses. And it's especially important in small buildings and um, buildings with lots of skin area, lots of wall area like an airport and buildings in cold climates. So we wanna keep the cold out and keep it from conducting through the wall. We're gonna add fluffy insulation. And to compare insulation here with thermal mass here, we're really talking about, um, uh, we're really talking about um, uh, uh, fluffy here for insulation and massive here for thermal mass. So if you think it has a high thermal mass, it probably does. Um, if you think it's a good insulator, it probably is. Things that have a lot of air pockets like uh, uh, foams and cellulose and glass fiber and mineral wool, uh, those are generally good insulators. Peak heating loads. Um, so if you had a space that was um, uh, that got really cold on some nights, um, then or if you uh, were trying to figure out how much to invest in your heating system, and you had a, a, some kind of a process going on, say an industrial process that required very specific temperatures, you would want to focus on peak heating loads because if you're making, I don't know, semiconductors and the temperature can never go below 60 uh, in the room, you want to make sure that even on the coldest nights, it would be catastrophic if it went below 60. Whereas if you are designing a indoor swimming pool, uh, you can assume that on the coldest part of the coldest nights, it's probably 3 a.m. and there might not be anyone there anyway. So if it gets down below 60, so be it, it'll be fine the next day. Deep daylight, this is a number four seed, but maybe it should be a number one seed um, for all the reasons I just mentioned. Daylighting is extremely important. And daylighting is not about how much light you bring in as much as you know the exam makes it sound like it is. And frankly, I think popular myth makes it sound like daylighting is about bringing in more light. In reality, daylighting is about bringing light into the darkest spaces, which are typically deepest in plan from the perimeter. So deep daylighting, if you're gonna do one thing, um, deep daylighting, if you're gonna do one thing today, it's figure out how to get daylighting deeper into your space. And you can do that by putting your windows higher, by making your floor plates thinner, uh, by using courtyards to bring light into the middle, by using skylights and roof monitors um, uh, to bring daylight in if you have access to a top floor by using atria to allow light to go deeper into a lower floor by not having the third floor go all the way over. You can bring more light in from the ceiling to the second floor and so forth. So deep daylight is the thing that you didn't know you needed, but trust me, um, that's the thing that will make your building sing. Um, mini split, that's what I'm gonna go over because everyone always has questions about mini splits. They don't understand totally how they work or they get them confused with, um, uh, they get them confused with fan coil units. So let's go over mini splits. So this is a split system. And you may remember if you've been taking the Amber book or if you've been studying for your exams, you'll remember that to make air conditioning work, the compression refrigeration cycle says that we need a low pressure refrigerant. That's what we have here inside the building in this case. And we have high pressure refrigerant out here. And the high pressure refrigerant gets hot and the low pressure refrigerant gets cold. And what we can do is we can take this fan and we can take room air and we can blow it across that coil and we can cool off the room air um, and we can provide a cool for the whole building, for the whole building. And typically we see this on fairly small buildings like, uh, well, single family detached residential, uh, maybe multifamily if it's limited to, you know, maybe four units or something. Um, we may see this in a small uh, freestanding medical clinic or something like that. Um, and generally it's perfectly fine, uh, but it just doesn't work that well if we need both heating and cooling on the same day. Um, enter a split system, enter a split system. In a split system, we have an outdoor unit here and we have indoor units often on the wall or on the ceiling. It looks here like it's on the floor, but in reality it's typically on the wall 
or in the ceiling invisible, you know, above the drop ceiling. Uh, and in, in this case, we have a single outdoor unit that's under high, has refrigerant under high pressure. And then there's a manifold, which is like a, an operator that's going to um, patch people through to the right line by, by connecting and disconnecting lines. So essentially, it's like valves that are opening and closing. And we're going to send refrigerant in low pressure to each of the three zones. And I remember, a zone might include six rooms. So each room doesn't necessarily have its own zone. Uh, often there are multiple rooms that share a single thermostat so that those rooms are all on one zone. So each of these three is one zone rather than one room, although one room could be one zone if you just have a thermostat for that room. Um, anyhow, so um, that's what we have in a split system. And so we can have the refrigerant itself is actually moving into the room and then air is moving from the room across the refrigerant and it's cooling it off. Uh, now you'll notice we don't have any easy way here to bring fresh air into the interior space, but we can do that with a separate very small ducted system because you don't need that much fresh air typically. And those type of ducts are actually pretty small. They're kind of at the scale of maybe a drain pipe. Um, so we can actually get away with doing that without having to, you know, drop our ceiling to accommodate a duct, for instance, or figure out how to move a duct around underneath a, a piece of structure above. Not a big deal when you're just bringing fresh air in and the, uh, the thermal comfort is being provided by room air. Um, and the other advantage of this, you see it's ductless. So this is called a ductless mini split, this particular version that I've drawn. Um, in this case, we've reversed it, so it's a heat pump, which means we've reversed it. We've made the low pressure cold part outside, which makes the high pressure inside, and we can provide heating to all three spaces. And the benefit of this is that on a mixed day, where we have east and west facing rooms, north and south facing rooms, or more commonly, but less thought of, I think, by architects, but more commonly, core rooms, which often need cooling in the winter, and perimeter rooms, which often need heating in the winter because they have skin area that's adjacent to the outside, so they have convective leaks coming in and they have conductive heat loss through the skin itself. Um, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a situation where we can make one room hot, one room warmer, and one room colder at the same time. And the advantage of that is several fold. Well, first of all. Um, the advantage is thermal comfort because we can provide cooling and heating at the same time. But the second advantage, if we have that mixed condition where we need something hot and something cold at the same time, what we're actually doing here, and this is kind of requires a little bit of a leap of faith and kind of just trust me, the physics works out, but we're moving heat from the too cold room, I'm sorry, we're moving heat from the too warm room to the too cold room. So the whole, whole system becomes more efficient because instead of that heat going outside or instead of that cool going outside, the, the, cool from, uh, uh, the cool from this room is going to this room and the heat from this room is going to this room and the whole system becomes more efficient. Generally, these systems are, I don't know, in the order of 5 to 20% more efficient. Um, uh, let's call it 15, 15% uh, more efficient. Um, than, than, than a system that only goes all cold or all hot. But of course, again, it depends on how many hours per year you're going to need simultaneous heating and cooling. And that's going to be dependent on your climate, but in large part, it's going to be based on your building and which way it orients and, uh, and how big it is relative to its skin area. All right, now, um, moving on. Interior color for daylighting. Uh, because of glare, this is another cheap, easy thing you can do, and daylighting is crazy important if you have human beings that are trying to perform uh, at some level as, as a clerical work or a call center or um, a barbershop, is to choose interior colors, especially on walls where there are windows, but just generally everywhere, interior colors that are light in color become very important and don't cost any money, and, um, and yeah, just look at the Scandinavians, they have that figured out. Uh, passive solar gain spaces, that's a low seed. It's really important in the exam, but it's not very important in your day-to-day -day life as an architect uh, if you're doing it right. So passive solar gain spaces are those ones that we see 
that are kind of the, um, you know, it's the, it's the classic, where we have a window on the south face, and in the summer, we have some thermal mass. Uh, in the winter, uh, we have some thermal mass, so it doesn't overheat in the summer. We have shading, so it doesn't, the sun doesn't come in directly when the sun's overhead in the summer. Um, and we have um, thermal mass in the winter. And the reason it's not that important is most of you are working on buildings that are either in warm climates or very big. And very big buildings require cooling just about year round, so the benefit of bringing the sun in uh, really only comes into play in sunny climates for small buildings, uh, sunny cold climates for small buildings. So I'm talking to you, Wyoming. Um, this would be very important in a small building in Wyoming, but it's less important just about everywhere else than you may have been uh, taught to believe. Not that it's not important, but it's just that we're going to lose a lot of heat at night through that same glass. We're going to still gain a lot of heat um, on warm spring days through that glass and so forth. Uh, so we, we may not want to have that much glass uh, and it may not be our best use of our time and money. But nonetheless, it's free heating, uh, so passive solar gain spaces will take them when we can use them. Electric light efficiency. Um, this is a number three seed. It really shouldn't be anymore. Uh, I think I'm going to switch that at some point. Um, just because lights have just become efficient. Um, this was a big need 15 years ago, <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, but these days lights are so much more efficient. The baseline kind of, even if you have a, a lighting engineer who's laying out lights, who doesn't know what he's doing, he's still gonna get you efficient lights because that's kind of the standard default now. So that is less important than it used to be, but very useful. And that's why many buildings on a per square foot basis um, that's why many of them are using less energy on a per square foot basis than, than they used to. Roof thermal mass, um, again, not very important unless you're in a, a very specific kind of climate where it's very hot in the day and very cold at night and you don't have insulation and you're not air conditioning. So this is an unlikely one to ever win a game. Uh, tree shading is excellent. That probably should be higher than a number seven seed. Everyone loves trees. Um, and if you plant them in the right spot, when I'm king, I'm going to make trees free, provided by the, the community, the government, and it's going to be, as long as you plant them on the east or west side of your building, or south side if it's deciduous, um, uh, uh, tree shading is, a, is an easy call, especially if you have a relatively small building. Obviously, if you have a 17, 20 story building, tree shading is going to be less effective because it's only going to provide shading for the, the, uh, uh, the first floor, maybe second floor, third. Uh, but it will also provide shading for the sidewalk. Uh, so if you have commercial going on at ground floor, tree shading is a, is a, is a worthwhile thing. And if you haven't thought about it uh, for the project you're working on now, today is a good day to start. Environmental noise, typically uh, that will win if you have a site that is near the airport, near a highway, or near a train line. Uh, outdoor noise becomes very important. Uh, sometimes if there happens to be an industrial process nearby, outdoor noise becomes very important. And certainly if there's sleeping going on, so if you have multifamily residential next to an interstate, which is surprisingly common, I can tell you as an acoustical consultant, I'm surprised by how many projects think that that's a good idea. Um, environmental noise is probably gonna make it to the final four. Uh, air tightness is a number two seed and a well-deserved one. Air tightness is the energy and moisture thing that you're not doing enough of, almost for sure. Uh, so air tightness is a great way to spend your time to learn more about air tightness. And it's really all about detailing and, uh, and construction administration, uh, kind of supervision on the site, making sure that uh, the skin behaves as the skin and the lungs behave as the lungs. And then wrapping up our east, uh, we have the low off-gassing finishes. Not to be confu confused with low off-gassing materials, low off-gassing finishes um, uh, are uh, uh, either a minimal finish position that you can take, so uh, use materials that don't have to be painted or stained, 
or use and specify paints and stains that are uh, low VOC, low volatile organic compounds, so they're less likely to cause um, either allergies or breathing problems or long-term health problems for the occupants. So again, if you're working on a, a healthcare anything, um, then low off-gassing finishes become very important. All right, and you can see, you can see the problem with, <laughs> now's a good time to talk about the problem with treating everything as a left path and right path kind of situation. Because um, if you do a final four, it's quite possible that the two most important things, so you just don't have that much time to focus on all these. And this is only a small, a small segment. I don't even think I have photovoltaics on here. I don't even have solar panels on here, right? So there's lots of things that I didn't even get to put on here that are very important and may come into play for you. So it could be that air tightness and low off-gassing finishes are two of the five most important things that you should be considering. But if you do it in this system, if you do it as a final four, the problem is if you look at the final four kind of at the end or the elite eight at the end, um, you won't see low off-gassing finishes, even though that may be a very important uh, metric. So um, take this all with a grain of salt if you use it. Know that you may have to put an asterisk next to one, even if it lost in the first round, it may be one of your five or ten most important uh, priorities that you actually really should be paying attention to. Because again, it's impossible to pay attention to all these for every project, especially if you're at the front half of your career. Now the beauty of this is, just like dating and making friends and earning money, uh, it snowballs. So you learn a lot about off-gassing um, for the allergy clinic you made, and then you already have a spec that includes low VOC paints that you can use for the racquetball court you're gonna make later. Even though low off-gassing finishes are not important in a racquetball court, why not use them? You already have a spec for them. So it becomes um, less, of a, uh, less of a transaction cost as the architect in terms of your time to start to address more and more of these if you delve into three or four of these each time you do a building, you delve into the three or four most important for that building, then you have those skills and that library in your pocket, in your head, in your specs. Um, you have all that uh, ready to go for your next project. All right, this is, a, 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 this is gonna be a, a longer than usual 40 minutes of confidence. All right, construction cost. Well, that, I don't have to tell you guys deal with that way more than I do, so I don't have to tell you that's the number one seed. Um, a loudspeaker system, which obviously is important if you have a space for performance or lectures. Uh, reverberation time, also important if you have a space for recording or, lec or performance or lectures or really any kind of unamplified talking as well. Cross ventilation. Um, cross ventilation is important if you have a small building in a humid climate where they're gonna turn off the air conditioning enough of the year to make it worthwhile. If you have that kind of climate, that kind of client, um, and then uh, and if you have predictable breezes and they, they blow enough of the year and you know where they're blowing from, then you can angle your building to capture those breezes and you can uh, uh, reduce the number of hours that the air conditioning is running and you can make an important connection to the outside because if your screensaver right now, if your desktop is some kind of outdoor you know, outdoor scene, sunset at a beach, a mountain to climb or whatever, um, that's because the uh, computer manufacturer knew that humans need those kind of views to be, to be mentally healthy. <laughs> Um, and so kind of any chance you have, that's another one that probably should be on here, just kind of a general connection with the outdoors, um, whether that be from daylight, from air, from view, uh, from ability to have a, your lunch break outdoors in a, in a courtyard or, or so forth. Uh, moving forward with the Midwest bracket, uh, moving heat within a building, that's kind of what we talked about a minute ago. If you have simultaneous need for heating in one area and cooling in another, moving heat within a building will become very important and will advance. Variable refrigerant. Variable refrigerant uh, flow, v, VRF, um, is kind of like this. Um, it's the same principle. Um, it's more efficient still, uh, maybe another 15% more efficient still. 
And it's the idea that to this thing, the thermostat here says, we need more coolant heating, boys. And then the, the, the heat kicks on in the space. It's an all off or all on system. So it will be off part of the time. And then when the room gets too hot or too cold, the thermostat will tell the system to run at full 100% capacity until the temperature gets reasonable. And then the thermostat will say, okay, we're good. Um, but um, with a VRF system, it's like this, but it's the same type of like a mini split or a multi split system. Um, but uh, multi split is just a bigger version of a mini split. But it, um, uh, but it, it can throttle the amount of uh, the amount of cooling from maybe five percent up to hundred percent. So if your room is just a little too hot, it'll give you just a little bit of cooling by sending just a little bit of refrigerant down there. And generally, they work. It's called a three pipe system. They have a the way these things work. Both the mini split, the multi split, and the VRF, uh, which are all kind of the same thing, uh, but for different size buildings. Um, uh, is um, uh, they'll have a pipe. Each of these lines represents a pipe, uh, represents three pipes, one that has gas in it, one that has liquid refrigerant in it. So the first has gas refrigerant, the second has liquid refrigerant, and the third has suction. And so in any of these cases, we can provide simultaneous heating and cooling to different zones because, and in this case, it's in the ceiling, but sometimes you see it on the wall like this. Sometimes it's in the ceiling like this. Uh, sometimes the thermostat's hardwired, sometimes the thermostat's uh, wireless. Um, but anyhow, we have an outdoor unit and we have these indoor units, and these indoor units serve as either evaporators or they serve as condensers. And, um, and if it's a condenser, we'll have the, uh, it'll open up the gas line and the liquid line, and the, the gas will condense into a liquid and then be brought back. If it's a uh, being served as an evaporator for cooling, uh, we'll open up this in that in that indoor unit in that evaporator. We'll open up the suction line and the uh, liquid line, um, and then we'll uh, uh, we'll have low pressure and we'll run a fan over that refrigerant. Now people get confused between uh, a mini split on the one side, the mini split or a VRF system or a multi-split on the one side and on the other side a fan coil unit because a fan coil unit also has a thermostat in the space it also has a fan in the space and it's also blowing room air over a local coil uh, and by local it could be in the closet it could be uh, on the wall it could be on the ground in the corner or it could be above the above the ceiling or it could even be in another room and be ducted over um, but anyhow, uh, typically it's in the room in the case of um, fan coil units. And so um, in the case of fan coil units, we're, the important differential between fan coil units on the one hand and VRF and mini split on the other is that in these cases we have refrigerant moving through the pipe. We have refrigerant moving through the pipe. That is a huge difference. Um, the actual uh, phase change, the actual magic of air conditioning is happening in the room in the case of these. Um, in the case of these, the fan coil units, the refrigeration is happening somewhere else. It's happening in the basement, it's happening in the central plant, um, it's happening somewhere else on the floor in the mechanical closet, and then chilled water is being pumped in, uh, uh, and that chilled water then, there's air being blown over the chilled water, and that's what's giving you the cooling. And sometimes we'll have like natural gas or electric resistance for heating if we need heating as well. So in the case of a fan coil unit, all the, all the intelligent stuff is happening somewhere else and the dumb stuff, just an air over a coil, is happening in the space itself. When do we use a fan coil unit versus when do we use a, um, a, uh, a multi-split? Um, go ahead and uh, answer that question for yourself. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer that question. When do we use a mini split versus when do we use an, uh, 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 a fan coil unit? All right. So, um, the fan coil unit um, is generally used uh, if we have a really big building or if we have long distances between the, 
mechanical plant that's making the coolth and the actual indoor units. So we can't do we can't do any kind of split system if this distance is too far. Now I have maximum of 65 feet here. The books tell you it's 100 feet, but the, the people who install these tell me it doesn't work as well if it's beyond 65 feet. Um, because the refrigerant here that's cold, it's, you know, the, the cold refrigerant, by the time it gets there, if it's too far, it's not cold anymore. So in really big buildings or big campuses, we generally are gonna have water um, but more and more popular, the, the BRF systems, the mini splits, the multi splits, they're becoming more popular. And now we can do them in fairly big buildings. I think we can, there are some times where this one outdoor unit uh, can serve, I think I saw one today, can serve 200 indoor units. I didn't think it was anywhere near that high. I figured it was about 10 or 20. Uh, but this is why it's becoming more popular in part. It's more efficient because we can simultaneously heat and cool. Um, it's more comfortable because we can simultaneously heat and cool. Uh, I'm talking about these, um, and um, uh, uh, and we can now do them for small and medium-sized buildings. The biggest buildings we'd still need to use a fan coil unit for. All right, I have a feeling we'll have some questions about that at the end. There always are, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and continue. Solar geometry. Solar geometry is all about knowing where the sun is, so you can do the shading, and so you can orient the windows and so forth. Uh, uh, number 13 C, the radiant heat gain from hot surfaces. So if you have a, a fireplace, we have to think about that. If you have radiators, we have to think about that. If you have radiant floor heating, we have to think about that. If you have uh, thermal mass in your building uh, for, a, um, uh, for a passive solar gain space, uh, we have to think about radiant heat gain from hot surfaces. Daylighting sensors tied to lights. So that's to reduce our lighting energy because um, uh, if the daylight, if the sun comes out and there's lots of sunlight in the room, uh, then the lights will dim. And if the light, if, the, if it's nighttime or if it goes behind a cloud, then the lights will, uh, the electric lights will creep back on. I don't like the phrase artificial light and natural light. It's all light. I prefer electric light and, uh, and uh, daylight. Anyhow, uh, stack ventilation. Um, stack ventilation people get confused with. Um, so stack ventilation is this idea that we have a building. And it's hot inside the building. There's a lot of heat gain from people lighting and equipment, from sun coming in, from conduction and convection. And so the warmest air is going to want to rise. So if we can give it somewhere to go up to, then the warmest air is going to rise. And it doesn't work unless we have a place for the air to come in. So there has to be an inlet, otherwise the, the system doesn't work because the pressure isn't right. And the warmest air is then going to go out the building. So we'll typically have louvers. And the benefit of this system is that it's um, is that it'll work even if the wind's not blowing or if the wind's not blowing from the right direction. So if the wind happens to be blowing from this direction or if the wind happens to not be blowing today, uh, we can still, uh, if we can evacuate our warmest air, um, then we can keep our building cooler for more of the year, run the air conditioning less and connect people with the outside. An evaporative cool tower uh, well, I'll talk about that. I think it comes up later. So I'll talk about that later. Um, process or plug loads. These are huge. Very important. That's why it's number three seed. Um, so just kind of talking to your clients about buying Energy Star computers for their desks and uh, what their policy is going to be for uh, a little refrigerator for each person and so forth. Uh, we can significantly reduce the overall energy use if we can work with our client to reduce the process, uh, which are plug loads are called process loads. Um, water evaporation. Okay, there's one that, that people get confused between stack ventilation and evaporative cool towers. An evaporative cool tower is, so this is something, this, this uh, evaporative cool tower is something that is for a hot, arid climate. So, whereas the, 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 um, uh, the stack effect ventilation was important 
for a hot, humid climate where we really want to promote air movement because the air is saturated and so evaporation doesn't happen naturally. In a cool, I'm sorry, in a hot, arid climate, we don't worry so much about evaporation from our skin. We don't have to induce air movement to create evaporation from our skin because the air is already thirsty. It's uh, already pretty dry there. So in, in an evaporative cool tower, which looks a little bit, I can draw it so it looks a little bit like a, um, uh, like a, a stack effect cooling tower. So I can see why people would be uh, confused. So in this case, in a hot, arid climate, we're going to introduce, we're going to have a spray. So we're going to have a little plumbing in there that's going to spray water, a fine mist. And as air that's hot and humid comes into contact with that dry mist, then the mist will evaporate. And that when that mist evaporates, it gets cool. And when air is cool, it sinks. So even though this is a red line, it's actually cool air that's sinking. And of course, again, we need a place for the air to go out to replace the air that's coming in. Otherwise, the whole system won't work. And in this case, this is called an evaporative cool tower. Which people also get confused because the name is similar with a, a cooling tower. In a cooling tower, a cooling tower is when we have our air conditioning system, in this case it's a chiller, so it's something that makes chilled water. It, it doesn't have to be, it could just be a refrigeration machine of any kind. But on one side, this side is the hot side under high pressure. And we can drown, we can bathe that hot side in water and we can pump that water up to the roof or outside to a, uh, a spot adjacent to the building or a central plant. And then we can kind of have a nozzle and we can have that water fall into a pool. This is called a cooling tower. And we may put a fan there, an impeller fan at the top. And again, louvers. And, when we, and then we're going to bring that water back. So we're always taking water, say, at 95 degrees. And then we're allowing air from outside to blow across the water, some of it will evaporate, much of it will be cooled, and the part that's evaporating will also help cool the water, because anytime anything evaporates, it makes everything around it cold. And then we're going to bring that water back here at 85 degrees. And so by doing that, we're constantly kind of cooling the hot side of the, of the compression refrigeration loop. And this is called a cooling tower. So you see these are very different even though two of them have similar names and two of them look kind of similar if you draw them like this. Although, you know, the, for the hot human climate, the, the, the stack effect cooling, you know, historically that's happened like this in section. So it doesn't always have to be a tower. It could just be an open window and a, a roof monitor that allows for the air that's warmest to go out. All right, continuing on, blocking wind in winter, very important for low slung buildings in cold climates with heavy winds. Um, vapor control, uh, that's a whole nother, gosh, I could do 20, uh, at least 10, uh, uh, 10 sessions on vapor control, but vapor control is this idea that we wanna make sure that we are um, According to NCARB, it's the idea that we want to keep vapor out of the building, but according to real life and physics, it's the idea that we want to allow moisture that's inside of an enclosure, uh, specifically a wall, uh, to be able to um, uh, work its way out eventually. We don't want to trap moisture if we don't have to. Our number two seed is roof insulation. Roof insulation is more important than wall insulation. I'll give you five seconds to figure out why.
All right. Um, roof insulation is more important than wall insulation because hot air rises. And insulation is more important in the wintertime because the delta T is bigger between inside and outside. So roof insulation uh, is all about, um, uh, is all about, uh, is probably the cheapest thing you can do for a small building in a cold climate uh, to reduce its energy use is to add additional roof insulation. All right, uh, native vegetation, I'm not a big fan. Um, I don't object to it, I guess, in theory, but in practice, I haven't seen it executed that well. But native vegetation will ostensibly use less water. That would be very important if you were in an area of the country where water use was at a premium. So if you were in the desert, native vegetation becomes more important. Architect's design time, this is a number one seed, so you only have so much time to attack these. So this has to be pretty important, plus you only have so much money that you can spend on your time. Your client is buying your time, typically. And so because your client is buying your time, you can't focus on all 64 of these. So you're gonna have to focus on a few of them. Uh, radiant heat loss to night sky. Again, that's we talked about this a bit before. Um, that's this idea that it gets hot in the day in the desert and it gets cold at night. And if you can promote um, uh, radiation to the cold night sky, you can cool off your building at night. Uh, daylight amount is a number eight seed. It's important, but not as important as people think. So you can daylight a building well without that much daylight. Um, as long as you bring it in deep and you have light colored surfaces, uh, you're actually probably going to be okay. So, all right, daylight amount. And generally, if you have, how much is, too, you know, too much? I don't know, you, you with 10 or 15% of, if you have, if you have 100, per 100 square feet of floor, if you have 15 square feet of window and it's positioned correctly, um, you're actually typically okay from a daylighting point of view. So 15% of the floor area, or even 10% of the floor area is often enough. Low E coatings, we talked about those in a recent, 40 minutes of confidence. It's this idea that you have a film that's in between layers of glass and that film reflects heat from the sun and uh, uh, low E coatings are number nine seed, but I could see them being higher seed. Efficient HVAC equipment, that's a number five seed. You could probably argue that could be a number one seed. Efficient HVAC equipment is not very sexy, but um, because HVAC is so much of a part of your energy use, uh, and because some equipment is so much more efficient than others, having efficient equipment is important. How do you get efficient equipment? You ask for it. So you ask your mechanical engineer at the beginning and you convince your client that it's important um, to have efficient HVAC equipment and then, um, and then uh, you can move forward knowing that even though you are not gonna get it published because of it, your efficient equipment is gonna save the planet. Courtyards, I'm on a one man mission to bring back the courtyard. And I've never heard anyone say, I, I have a courtyard in my building, but I don't like it. Everyone loves a courtyard. It helps with daylighting um, and, uh, and it provides a place to connect to the outside. Um, mechanical noise, number four seed, very common problem, not typically thought of until afterward. So mechanical noise is obviously very important in any space that needs to be quiet, any space for recording or performance, but really any space for thought or concentration or um, human performance in terms of, you know, whether you're a track athlete practicing an indoor track or uh, whether you're an accountant uh, kind of uh, running through the numbers, uh, excessive mechanical noise can add uh, distraction and add stress to your life. And it's really common and it's actually pretty easy to prevent if you think about it at the earliest stages of design. You say, okay, these are the rooms that need to be quiet. These are the new rooms that can be noisy, the bathrooms, the hallways, storage rooms, and you put the bathrooms and the hallways and the storage rooms in between the mechanical room and, uh, and the spaces that are being served, like the classrooms, and in that way, you can significantly limit the likelihood that mechanical noise will be a problem in your building, and it didn't even cost you anything. But later on, it's going to cost you a fortune, and you're still not going to get it right, even with the consultant. Uh, radiant heat losses to surfaces, um, that's uh, most prevalent if you have either chilled beams or if you have uh, a very large window and you're in a cold climate and people are right next to that large window. Um, even if the air temperature is warm, 
you're actually emitting radiant energy. This is a crazy idea. People don't really buy it. Uh, they never really believe me when I talk about it. Um, but if you've ever said, man, I just can't get warm today, it's quite possible that you're next to a large cold surface, typically a window, and because that surface is large relative to your skin, and because the surface is cold relative to your skin, you're actually losing heat to that surface and you just can't figure out why you can't get comfortable. An occupancy sensor tied to fresh air. Uh, this is important in intermittently heavily occupied buildings. So if you have a track stadium that only fills up a couple of times, indoor track stadium that only fills up a couple of times a year, you don't wanna be bringing in um, uh, outside fresh air to keep that space fresh if no one's in it 99 hour, hours out of 100. You wanna only open the damper that brings in the fresh air when the CO2 levels in the room rise up. And in that way you can, uh, in that way you can significantly limit the uh, energy use from all that extra fresh air that you would otherwise have to heat or cool by simply not bringing it in when people aren't in the room. Um, freedom from echo, uh, uh, this is important in any space with unamplified music or speech performance. Um, lecture halls, uh, auditoria, uh, concert halls, opera houses, and so forth. And again, this is one of those times where um, if you have a uh, uh, high, school, high school auditorium, freedom from echo will be very important, maybe one of your top three, and occupancy sensor tied to fresh air because it's not occupied very often might also be one of your top three. Um, so it's one of those cases where the top two teams actually may be playing each other in the first round and it's one of the shortcomings of this system. Rounding out the rest of the west bracket, uh, we have peak cooling loads. So if you have a situation again where we're making semiconductors and it can never get above 80 degrees, um, then the peak cooling load is gonna be very important. Otherwise, it's really not that important, especially if you talk to your client and you say, look, it may, we're, we can save a ton of money and make the system way more efficient if, you, if you're willing to be uncomfortable for a couple of hours a year when it's just the warmest part of the year, you know, if it's a record-breaking day, just be okay being a little uncomfortable, put a few fans on, uh, on your desks and be okay. We can save a boatload of money and a lot of room for mechanical equipment and we can save the planet, make the system quieter, a bunch of good things come, come from that. District heating plant, so we might have a, a steam plant Again, that's just like our chiller plant for the district that's going to be useful and relevant if we have uh, a campus for a hospital, a campus for a university, a campus for a corporate headquarters, a campus for a bunch of government buildings, so lab buildings, whatever. Uh, speech privacy um, is going to be uh, important. Um, this is not speech security, although it certainly is related to it. Speech security is like if you have, you know, spies or talking or, you know, really uh, a fancy law firm where you may have a, a client talking and you wouldn't want that to uh, leak out from an a office worker that happened to be uh, changing the toner in the next room. But speech privacy is important just for kind of concentration. So if I can hear the person in the next cubicle or the person in the next office talking on the phone with their wife, um, it's going to make it more difficult for me uh, to do my job effectively. Um, Interior water use is of course important anywhere where we don't have enough water. So west of the Mississippi, this becomes important. East of the Mississippi, I'm not yet convinced this is a priority. Um, window U value, this is really important for any small buildings um, that are in mixed or cold climates because it would not be unusual for something like a house to lose half of its heat to the, uh, to the U value, uh, and half of its heat through the window conduction uh, so we want to make sure we have uh, good window U value, which includes things like double or even triple pane glass. It includes things like uh, window frames that are, have thermal breaks in them instead of thermal bridges. Uh, it includes things like, um, uh, uh, to a lesser extent, low E co coatings and, and, and uh, argon in the cavity. And finally, our last one is landscaping water use, which again, is very important west of the Mississippi. Uh, maybe we start to think about a xeriscape or some kind of landscaping system that doesn't require native vegetation, something that doesn't actually require 
uh, water use at all. But there's lots of things I didn't include. Um, uh, this is a by no means exhaustive list. I bet I could get to close to 100 if I put everything on here. But you'll have to do that for your own project. All right, now, moving on to our question. We had a question before um, uh, that I asked and nobody answered it. Nobody gave me a good answer. Um, we had a public building with a rec center with an ad alternate of a tennis court. And we said the bidder A, the base bid for the rec center of 800,000 and the tennis court is an extra 100,000. So the total for both is 900,000. Bidder B had the base bid for the rec center of 810. So bidder B was more expensive on the base bid, but less expensive with the addition of the tennis court. Bidder B, because the tennis court was cheaper as an ad alternate, was now $65,000. Um, for the tennis courts, the two together is 875. So bidder B is cheaper with the tennis court. Bidder A is cheaper without the tennis court. You have a public building. What the heck are you supposed to do? I got no satisfying answers from all the experts I talked to, including you guys. And then this week, I thrilled the report. I saw it. I found it on um, on AIA, AIA document A710, which is not a bad document actually to look over if you're taking CE. Um, and if you're taking the Amber book, I've taken the most important parts of that document and put in the flashcards uh, a section of the, of the Amber book. But um, what that says is it says, unless otherwise prohibited by law, the owner shall have the right to accept alternates in any order or combination unless otherwise specific, specifically provided in the bidding documents and to determine the lowest responsive and responsible bidder on the basis of the sum of the base bid and alternates accepted. So in short, the answer is it's up to the owner. So if the owner has bid A and it's cheaper than bid B for the base building and the owner has bid B and it's, it's, more, it's cheaper than bid, bidder A for the base building plus the tennis court, the owner can then say, huh, I think it's worth having the tennis court. Or the owner could say, I don't think it's worth having the tennis court and can go back to the other bidder. So the, as long as bidder A and B, uh, both um, uh, responsive and responsible, and by responsive it means it seems like they actually did all the things they had to do to submit the bid. It seems like they're, um, uh, they've, they've covered everything in their bid. And responsible means it, you know, they're a legitimate company that's not, you know, that actually has a track record of building successful buildings. Um, as long as both bidders are competent and, and met the requirements of the bid process, then it is up to the owner and he or she can decide whether to go with bidder A or bidder B. All right. For next time, our question for next time is, uh, how do you convey electricity to the desk in the middle of the open plan floor? Be as specific as you can. The building is of concrete construction. The building is of concrete construction. All right, now we're gonna take our little break. Uh, folks, can, uh, folks can leave or they can stick around for individual questions. Because today's went so long, uh, I'm only gonna take two individual questions. I know you probably have many. Uh, you can uh, put them in the chat and I will try to get to them later or you can bring them up next week, but I don't like these things taking two hours. I think um, if I do that, I will scare away people for the future. Um, so I'm going to limit it to two questions. So for those who are ready to take off, you can take off. And for those who have questions, stick around. Sure. So, so each, each system has a series of advantages and disadvantages. And those include things like noise and efficiency and size of ducts versus pipes and um, uh, number, of, uh, number of pieces of equipment that have to be maintained and air quality and on and on and on, right? So there's all these, all these different factors that come into play. So if you are asking about a VAV system, for instance, a VAV system is a variable air volume system where it's all ducted. And so many of this, uh, many of the buildings built between, I wanna say maybe, you know, bigger buildings built between 1985 and 2010. Um, if it's a big building and it's got ducts and, and grills and, and supply registers and so forth, it's often gonna be a VAV system. And in a VAV system, 
the advantage is this is a this is such a difficult. If you're an Amber Book user, you'll you can go through the the um, you can go through the section on HVAC. Um, but um, but from a VAV point of view, the advantages um, are that we can bring fresh air even to rooms that are in the interior. Um, the advantages are if we have a corridor, it's not going to be that hard to run a single duct down the corridor. So for something like a school, if you have classrooms, it's often going to be a VAV. Um, you have some thermal control. VAV can be good at heating and cooling at the same time if it has reheat associated with it. So if there's reheat at the VAV box. Um, these are all kind of in the weeds questions, but they're pretty important. Mechanical systems are big and they really start to dictate things like ceiling height and size of building and, um, and you wouldn't do a VAV like if you had a renovation. You might not do a VAV because you have to put ducts everywhere. In a renovation, you might do something like a fan coil unit. So a fan coil unit we saw here. In a renovation, you can run pipes and just put a uh, you can just put a um, uh, you can just put a fan in each room and run the pipes, and that way you don't have to worry about uh, worry about ducts. But the problem with the fan coil units is they're loud. There's a fan in the room, so it's loud. And if we have this zone here, we don't have an easy way without a separate ducted system to bring fresh air. So there's no fresh air available. Um, uh, but they're cheap to put in. Because um, you don't have to put all that duct work, but there's a lot of equipment to buy and mount and maintain And so now we have to run fans here and because we're running a bunch of fans It may be that a fan coil unit is using more energy than the VAV system so a VAV system is often used in schools a, um, uh, uh, a Fan coil system is also often used in schools uh, The VAV system is better I think because it's quieter and schools are places where you need to be able to hear the teacher. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, VAV systems for a school. Um, if you have a theater in the school uh, or a gym in the school, that theater or gym may have a single zone because it needs, its, you're not gonna want the classroom to share the air with the gym. The gym gets hot because people are moving around and the gym gets sweaty, so we don't wanna recycle the air. So we don't want the air from the gym going into the classroom and vice versa. Um, and so um, uh, it wouldn't be a VAV, but it would be a ducted system like a VAV. In the gym, it just would be a single fan that's in some other room that's gonna go down the hallway, the duct is gonna go down the hallway and it's gonna service the gym. So, you know, the question you asked is almost like, you know, it's almost like asking if there's God um, in terms of its complexity because there, there, is, um, uh, there is no single answer, but there are, there are, but the exam will ask you questions like that and say, you know, which is best. And so I think what you need to do is understand the advantages and disadvantages of those systems and then be able to say, okay, this needs to be quiet or this needs to be low energy or this needs fresh air, or this needs a lot of thermal control just for this particular room because it's a theater and it needs to be quiet in the theater and the theater is often not, in the high school is often not gonna be used so that way we can just keep it off most of the time if it's its own system. Whereas if the theater is part of the system of the rest of the school, um, then uh, there's gonna be air going on and off and sometimes the theater needs a ton of fresh air uh, much more than the classrooms do, but if they're all sharing the same uh, uh, branch duct going down the hallway, then that doesn't make a lot of sense because the theater needs a ton of fresh air for all those people. So there's no way to kind of, there's no rule of thumb that I can answer that with without kind of un unwrapping all those different systems and all those different uh, preferences. And then sometimes the systems don't even have a word for it. So. It's like a meal. Some meals have a word for it. Um, uh, I had sushi last night, I could say. Um, some meals don't have a word for it. Well, I, you know, I kind of had some grapefruit and, and then I got hungry later, so I had Cheerios and, uh, and then I had some cheese. You know, <laughs> There's no word for that meal, uh, but it's still a meal. So um, I'm sorry I can't be of more help. If you can um, be more specific without giving any way for anything away from the exam, I can definitely answer a specific question.
for a situation where you have a, a feeding a high feeding load in in a school or, or in a large building, would you mix systems? Like would you yes. Put yes, because of the radiant. Remember, I was talking about the radiant heat losses to big windows. So one of the there are several advantages. What you can do is you can have a system for air, and then you can also have a radiator here. And so what happens is that way the person who's sitting here next to the window, um, he's he's losing heat to the window because it's cold. Let's say it's zero degrees out, but he's gaining heat from the radiator which is near the window. That's why we put radiators near windows. So if you have a, and the other advantage of a radiator is it's hydronic, it's got water. So water keeps its heat over longer distances. Um, so pretty efficiently, we can provide um, radiant heat to the perimeter and we can provide uh, uh, fresh air uh, through a fan coal unit or a VAV system, uh, usually a VAV system, uh, for the room and some additional heating and we can provide cooling for the core so we can have cooling in the core room here by putting uh, by running uh, a duct of cold air to that room and we can have heating in the perimeter room um, by, by having radiators with hydronic hot heat hot water so a mixed system in a cold climate is very common Yes. Um, so this is just asking <laughs> for a general thing. It doesn't come from stemming from um, any question I've seen. Um, if, if you had to sort of talk briefly about comparing whether to do, um, maybe let's do solar um, PVs um, since you didn't Yeah, so there's a um, there's a economists make assumptions. Economists are famous for making assumptions, and there's a joke among economists that says that two economists are stuck on a desert island, and their boat that sunk uh, also washed up a bunch of cans of food, but no can opener. So they had no way to open the cans, and they thought, well, we're both really smart. Uh, we're both economists, let's figure out a way. You go for an hour over there, I'll go for an hour over here, and we'll each think for an hour about how we're gonna open these cans. And after an hour, they got back together, and the first economist said to the second, so what'd you come up with? And the second economist said, all right, let's start with the assumption that we have a can opener, and move from there, which of course is stupid, because they don't have a can opener. And so, the reason I tell you that joke, which is funny to me, I don't know why, I find that very funny. Um, the reason I tell you that joke is because there, there are so many assumptions being made in that question. So you're assuming that there's not going to be a mechanical system put in later. You're assuming that the client is going to be okay with that. You're, you know, the, and in reality, um, the, the pass, you're talking about passive only, right? I'm asking kind of, um, how do you, like if you had to make a decision whether to put active PVs in your, um, on your house, get the backup and then utilize like mechanical versus, um, like passive, passive only works full time on a small scale project, right? 
I mean, even even then, it really doesn't. I, you know, not not for ninety nine percent of clients in ninety nine percent of climates. So if you're in California and you have a client that's absolutely committed to passive, then absolutely it can work. But if you are in anywhere but California or you know or Italy or Australia, and uh, you know these kind of amazing climates where it's never hot and it's never cold. Um, uh, or if that client is ever going to sell the building, um, you can assume that active systems are going to be put in. So if that building is going to be there for 75 years, even if your client doesn't want it, I think you can rightfully assume that for 50 or 60 of that 75 years, it will have mechanical systems added retroactively. So if you don't put the ducts in, that means there's going to be window units sticking out of it later. Um, so I, I just think it's a false choice, this idea. You can have... so. What I would prefer you focus on is using passive systems to minimize the uh, number of hours and the amount of use of active systems um, to stretch the amount of days that we're comfortable to use daylighting so we have less electric lighting and so forth. Um, but there will always be, um, you know, unless it's like a nature center or something like that, there will almost always be active systems added later anyway. So, um, so it's kind of a false choice. It's like saying, do you want your car to be red or do you want it to be large? It's kind of almost two different things, even though they are related. Um, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not really a choice of active or passive. It's a matter of using passive and natural systems to minimize the use of your active systems. That makes sense. Now, many of us were taught in school um, by people who were like those economists. And I used to be one of those teachers. I will tell you that from 2001 until 2005 or six, um, I taught like passive is better than active. You know, so there's... So that's, that's, that's what I'm getting at. That's yeah. what it, you know, it But it's not, like right. But, it, but, 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 but after I started looking at buildings and kind of like, you know, being realistic about human nature, um, it just seemed less helpful to think of it that way because in reality, the active systems will be there unless you have a very specific client who you know is gonna own the building forever and a very specific climate. Um, but even then, I think it's often gonna be added later. So yeah, and, and, and I'm not so sure that photovoltaics are passive. You know, they, they produce electricity. Um, they're renewable, um, but they're producing electricity to run other things as well. So that's, a th that's, a, that's probably a whole other like, question for the, uh, for the energy philosophers, the architectural philosophers. But, um, but yeah, I, I, would prefer that, I would prefer that you not even go down that route of kind of uh, using shorthand to, 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 um, yeah, to assign an ethical value or a, a yeah, to, to assign an ethical value to one or the other, when in reality, uh, if you have taller ceilings, you are going to have a cooler building. If you have a cooler building, the air conditioning needs to work less, because the, the heat will rise and they'll be farther away from the occupants. That's a passive system, but it's making the air conditioning work less. If you have, uh, if you have um, uh, windows that orient towards the breezes, uh, you can open them up and, uh, and you have a high pressure inlet and a low pressure outlet, you can uh, you can cool off your building. That's you know, ten more hours this week. You can not have your air conditioning running. I would prefer you just kind of think of it that way. All right. Thank you guys very much. Uh, sorry we went over this time. I think I significantly underestimated how long it would take me just to read sixty five words and describe them. And thank you guys for sticking around. The ones who are left. I will see you guys next week. I'll take a look at any uh, any questions that are in the comments. And I'll be sure to tackle the, uh, maybe not all of them, uh, but I'll be sure to tackle some of them next week when we talk about electrical raceways. Take care.